Well, good morning. Namaste. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here with you. Um, I'm an India junkie. I love it. I think it's an amazing country, and I think this is an incredible time to be practicing design and user experience. Um, I was here first about five years ago speaking at a different conference, and I got to meet some of you there too. And I feel like in the five years that I've been away and come back, you guys have progressed to like about 30 years worth of design and user experience thinking. Um, so congratulations. I applaud you. Very, very amazing work. I was talking to Sarah about this. I feel like, you know, we're going to come back in another five years and it's going to be switched. We'll just sit here and be like, wow, look at all these things they've leapfrogged in India with this new practice and all these new issues and challenges that they're solving. And you're just, you're just going to impress us and keep teaching us all these amazing things. So thank you for inviting me to be here. I'm not going to talk about Facebook today. I hope that's okay. But I am going to talk about social, which kind of bridges Facebook and about a million other things. So how do we create social value? Not an easy thing. First, we need to get rid of comfortable ideas. As Mark discussed with us earlier, um, if we just want to stay in the current situation and not examine the gap, that might be comfortable, but it's probably not going to get us very far. We have to really be able to let go of that and be open to the new. We have to embrace being scared. Um, so what if we could see being scared or fear as our friend and not our enemy? And what if we could almost use that as a litmus test to think about as we design things and as we, as we see problems and see gaps and new opportunities? If we're not scared by what we're thinking about, then maybe we're not thinking broadly enough. Maybe we're not challenging ourselves to be thinking more differently or more new or more you know, big and broad. So if we want to um, start getting scared and uncomfortable, <laughs> there's probably going to be problems we're going to run into because when you're scared and you're uncomfortable, everything is on the edge of sort of a new vista and something new can be very scary and problem raw. And I think that's okay. <laughs> I think we have to become comfortable with that being okay. Um, to be willing to take those bigger risks, we're going to have problems. And so I love that Guy Kawasaki talks about this quite often. He says we're going to eat our problems for breakfast. Expect them and then eat them. You know, today I had a disastrous design session and I ate toast. It's OK. Just expect that it's going to happen and move on. So we also need to be very curious. Um, and I think if some of you were in Ray's workshop the other day, one of the things he mentioned, which I loved, was if you talk to, and I'm going to butcher the exact quote, so I apologize in advance, Ray. But um, if you ask a, a classroom full of kindergarten age children who can draw, they'll all raise their hands. And if you ask, this entire auditorium full of us lovely adults, design practitioners who can draw, maybe half of us will raise our hands. Um, so I think you really need to be able to unpeel those layers and step back and try to see the whole world and all of the problem sets that you're encountering through the eyes of a child or through the eyes of someone who doesn't have all the preconceived notions that we do over the course of our lifetime. So to be able to think about um, things from a completely new way and really try to be unencumbered with what your expectations are of what the answers are going to be. You also need to be provocative. <laughs> Not always easy. It takes a lot of courage. Um, in the workshop that I led a few days ago, one of the groups we were working with some content around farming and a group called Digital Green that I'll talk about a little bit later. And uh, we were all working through different exercises together on the content. And one of the teams, I'm sure you guys are in here, um, decided, you know what, digital green's great, but we don't want to work on farming. We're going to solve Ebola. And we're going to make a whole new startup called Digital Humanity. And I just think that's absolutely fabulous and amazing. And I hope you guys do it. Maybe you already have. It's been over a day. And in time, you know how fast things move now, you probably registered the domain and whatnot um, by now. So I'm very excited to see that. But I think that's a really good example of being provocative. You know, like don't always go with, along with a set of um, constraints or problems that you see in front of you. Really question all of them and sort of break out of them anytime that you have the opportunity to do so. Also, investigate new directions. So thinking about how much technology is changing and the opportunities that that affords us, thinking about our abilities to harness social or human power, which is broader than ever, um, either through technology or through just real life and um, the coming together of people and what the power can be in doing that. It's also time to investigate new directions in gesture, apparently. So like if you can use the power of mudra, I encourage that as well. 
based on our earlier discussion this morning, but really thinking about all new directions that you can take into your work. Um, also adaptation. One of the students that I talked to uh, on the conference, I think on Thursday, was saying that they're taking on studying the traffic patterns in Bangalore and how can that change, which I extremely applaud and <laughs> very excited to see what comes of that. That couldn't be probably a more complex problem to take on. But I think that that's a beautiful example of thinking about how do you adapt to what's going on in a culture, the social patterns, the social flows, um, everything that's sort of the given it, in an, an existing experience, and think about adapting to that. Also transformation. Um, you know, in one of the earlier uh, opening talks we heard about a couple of days ago, uh, what GE Healthcare was doing in some of the uh, MRI facilities where instead of putting sort of medicine and equipment at the heart of the situation, they began to step back and think about the patient and put the patient first. And so in transforming the patient experience, there's now calming ambient lighting and um, much more attention to what they're actually going through. So using trans transformation as a trigger is a beautiful thing too. So creating solutions with profound change is extremely tough. <laughs> But I think that you're all capable of it, and I'm super excite, excited to see where you take this. Um, when you think about social innovation, one of the definitions that I've heard in describing it is that it's any product, process, or initiative that profoundly changes the defining routines, patterns, flows, cultural beliefs, and practices of a given social system, and that social innovations transform intractable problem domains. It sounds pretty daunting, so I think we need to break it down and make it a little bit more tactical and manageable. <laughs> so I'm going to take you through some examples of how I think we can make it a little more plausible for designers. So there's three things that I want to cover. And I'll give you a few examples for each. First, you need to find a problem space or a gap that exists. So this is a lot about you know, what Mark was talking about on the creative journey, and I think that that's exactly spot on. Finding that problem or gap can sometimes be the challenging thing, although I feel like there's so many opportunities out there because there are complex systems and because designers and design thinking have become so accepted in a broader social sense and in a broader professional and cultural sense that we have been given the license now, I think, to really start to utilize all the power and all the ideas that we can bring to the table across the process of problem solving and whether it's at a, creating a digital app and sitting with the product manager and the engineering or development or technology lead, or whether it's really sitting down and thinking about, you know, how do we change an entire society's traffic patterns like in Bangalore? The range of spectrums of what we're being invited to work on is pretty amazing these days. So then we need to create meaningful provocations, right? We, we can't just get comfortable with what we're designing and make the next, you know, V2 release or get the beta out or, you know, change that feature overnight. Like, that's all great sort of run, run the business kind of stuff, but we really need to, like, provoke ourselves to think more broadly about it and then develop the product or service as the solution for that gap. So we're going to cross industries because one of the things that I noticed is listening to Bapu, I think, on the first day was just how broad um, the audience is in terms of the industries that we come from and the industries that we practice in and the types of projects that we're taking on. So we're going to go from restaurants to medical to farming. It's going to be fun. Um, so restaurants. Uh, so there's a problem, at least in the US. This, this particular example is New York-based. Uh, cooks get really unfair wages. Um, there's a restaurant called Per Se in New York that's probably one of the most expensive there and probably in the world. And I'm going to have to give this example in dollars. You can correct me in rupees later, but you'll get the scale um, understanding, I think. So a meal can cost four, five, six hundred dollars per person going in and out in terms of like food, wine, etc. The cooks, uh, the line cooks, not the named chef, but the line cooks get about $12 an hour um, in what they make. So huge, huge disparity, very unfair wages. The kitchens are hot, they're crowded, sometimes they're dirty, not very comfortable. People, uh, so that's sort of the cooking and the chef and the restaurant side of the perspective. The consumers are the people that, that are the restaurant goers. They want to have good food at home. And they also have no time to cook, which is why they go to restaurants or have takeout quite frequently in New York. So the provocation here could be something like, what if cooks got paid really well? <laughs> and it was a great profession because it was lucrative. What if they had space to cook alone? What if people did, what if there were no restaurants? People didn't have to go to restaurants. They didn't exist. And what if someone else prepared the meal for them? And so with those provocations, uh, a group 
in New York created, created an app called Kitchen Surfing. And what this does is it's bringing chefs direct to people in their homes. And so they're enabling people to um, look for a chef to cook whatever cuisine they want for however many people they want on whatever date they want. So it's not like a long-term relationship. It's sort of a, a just-in-time food preparation solution. And so they're, they're really bridging that gap in a completely new way. And I'm very excited to see where they go with that. Looking now to healthcare, there's all kinds of things we can improve all over the world in healthcare, right? So doctor's office. This one is a US-wide example in parts of Europe that's being um, uh, tested in as well. So there's no price transparency um, in certain parts of the world in terms of how much you're going to pay for a service. And there's a lot of price discrepancy where you could pay um, 10 times an amount at one location or office or hosp uh, doctor's office or hospital than you might in another. There's unused medical equipment. So um, in the, the GE healthcare example that we looked at, you know, there's the huge MRI uh, machines, which are <laughs> extremely expensive to procure. And so when a healthcare provider or a hospital buys one of these machines, it's a huge, huge investment. And if they don't have it used fairly regularly, um, it's not a great return on investment, even though it's obviously critical for patient care. So that's a big, a big problem. And then it's also sometimes difficult to find appointments, um, either that meet your calendar or things come up or it's last minute or it's urgent and you really need someone to pay attention to your health care immediately. And so um, there's this issue of not enough appointments or at the right time um, sort of paradigm piece of, of it too. So the provocation is, you know, what if we could show price tags on visits to the doctor or the hospital or to get an MRI scan or whatever it might be, be that the patient needs? What if the equipment was always efficiently booked and there wasn't downtime unless it was planned? And what if it was as easy as online shopping? So the solution, um, a, a healthcare provider or an insurance actually company in the US called Aetna has formed a new innovation team. And so when I was at Hot Studio, we worked with them on something called WellMatch. And the idea here is you bring discounted medical equipment um, and services to the patients. And the way that you do that is basically you can find a healthcare provider, look at pricing and procedure, and track benefits, which is sort of a US thing. But so the idea here is I can now look and see, oh, OK, things that are important to me are that I really have to do this um, MRI scan by Thursday because of some other medical treatments that I'm going to need. So I can look and see on Thursday which hospitals or doctors near me might have time slots open where I can book time to get in and do the MRI scan. And oh, look at this between doctor's office A and healthcare provider B. You know, this one's going to be 10 times the cost or three times the cost. So this one fits in my time schedule and it's a lot less expensive. So it's more of a consumer shopping uh, take on healthcare. This one is about um, word of mouth or willpower. Sorry, the jet lag and parchment has finally caught up with my uh, water intake here. So word of mouth and willpower ideas. So another problem is that there's not, even when um, healthcare companies and corporations or businesses do join to get together to try to create wellness programs in many parts of the world to try to proactively um, keep people healthy and aware and, and uh, sort of engaged in being healthy and well, they're not very often used um, or very well used today. It's hard sometimes also to have willpower when we want to do something. Um, you know, we might get the momentum or the motivation and then it dips and then it comes back and it dips. <laughs> so you need to really kind of be constantly befriending yourself or keeping your friends and colleagues around you um, to help friend you and keep that willpower going. But they're not always there. And then it's tedious work to get good care sometimes. It takes a lot of effort and research to figure out healthy patterns, whether it's nutrition or fitness or mental health or physical health conditions. So in this provocation, thinking about using social networks and mobile, right? So if there's not a lot of use of programs, then well, why is that? And how can we use, how can we leverage social technology um, to help us do a better job of that? And then in terms of uh, willpower, what if we could just increase it as needed? Like, hey, I need a boost right now. <laughs> Somebody help me out with my willpower. And then what if we had friends that were always there to help, no matter what time of day, where you were in the world, you just always have a friend there. And what if it was as easy as playing a game, so it was actually enjoyable? <laughs> so the solution here was, this is a couple of years old, but I think this one is an interesting one. Uh, we worked on this at Frog Design. 
and this is called Tempted, and it leverages your social networks, mobile devices, and gameplay to increase your personal willpower as you need it most. Uh, so the idea here is that if you are having a moment of weakness, let's say that you've decided you're going to give up smoking, or you're going to give up drunk dialing your ex, or you're going to give up whatever you decide you're going to give up, that you really want to stick to it. And so you would connect with friends on Facebook or whatever social network or uh, create your own social um, surrounding of, of friends to text with or whoever it might be. And they would then be able to see whatever temptations you wanted to, to have help with. And so if you are tempted to um, not exercise and you, you've set out this goal for yourself that you really want to get in shape and be healthy, then you could put that out there and you could say, you know what? I'm really tempted to hit that snooze alarm right now and go back to sleep for a half hour because I don't really want to go work out. And you could put that out there and so your friends would see this and be able to give you a boost. <laughs> and then within the system, um, those are considered karma points. <laughs> so if I just cannot get up this morning and I put it out there and Mark sees it and he says, I'm going to give Jennifer a boost and try to get her butt out of bed and into the gym, then Mark would get some karma points. And there's yellow belts and there's a whole sort of system of gameplay and, and game design, interaction design. But it's a really nice way, I think, to um, sort of harness the power of people. So farming. Uh, so those of you who are in my workshop will have to bear with me because you know a little bit more about digital green than the rest of the audience. But farming. If we have the problem that farming is, is, can be isolating, right? It's kind of, um, you have the people that work on your farm, but it's, a fair, it's kind of like owning a small business or being the CEO of a startup, right? You've, everything's on you. You don't necessarily have time to in, engage with a lot of other people. It can be isolating. It can be difficult to learn new methods. It's hard to um, you know, really have access to a lot outside of what's going on in the village or the community where you are farming. And it's hard to meet other farmers um, from a timing and distance sometimes perspective too. Also, not tracking the success of new methods. So if you're trying things but you don't have the time to measure and sort of bring that feedback loop to closure. So provocation here would be, what if you could have group discussion and exchange with other farmers or other practitioners in sort of the agricultural arena what if you could learn new methods on video? What if the farmers could watch the videos together and maybe there might even be volunteers to help measure and track that so that they, not all of the burden would be just on the farmer? And so a group called Digital Green um, came up with this idea where they could help farmers share best practices over video across communities. And so when I was at Hot Studio, we worked with them. And of course, the first question is, how are the farmers seeing digital video? <laughs> I don't think they're sitting in the barn Googling the video and watching it there. Um, and you'd be very right if that's what you're thinking. So what happens is um, the team from Digital Green and other nonprofits go around to the different farms and they will videotape um, the farmers or the farmhands working on whatever it might be that is their best practice. So like better um, seed development or better harvesting or whatever it might be. And then they will go back and upload that video and it will become shareable across the network of volunteers and organizations that then want to go out and help more farmers. They'll bring a little Pico projector out into the field, literally, and they will project it like on the side of a barn, for, for example, and they'll invite all the farmers uh, sort of within the community or the given sort of walking distance to come watch the video. It's heavily moderated. They're pausing. They will stop and do questions and um, really have an engaged and interactive discussion about what are these best practices. And then at the end, any of the farmers that want to uh, employ those new methods will sort of engage with the volunteer to be set up to be tracked for about six months. They'll touch base with them, make sure it's going okay, answer any questions they have, and then see if, in fact, the best practice from a measurable perspective has helped. And so that, and all that data get, gets uploaded again into the system, and so the volunteers have a really nice sense of how many videos have been seen, what, do, what are the numbers in terms of who's watched them or who they've been shown to. Um, how many of them were liked or they appreciated the content, and then also um, how many yielded successful sort of better practices. And so it's a really nice, I think, closed loop example of thinking really end to end about um, a design problem that was solved with very innovative and provocative thinking. And as sort of a secondary um, nice nature of it, they're also training uh, teenage and young 20s villagers and the kids basically of the farmers on how to do the video taking and the video um, updating, uploading, editing, and whatnot. So they'll also have potential career growth as well. So how can you create solutions with profound change when you 
go out on break or walk back into the office next week. I'm sure you've got a million things swirling in your heads. I want to hear all of them at the break. Um, but I think, you know, some approaches are really to just think broadly. So embrace the larger ecosystem of social value and knowledge and then design to the specific pieces, you know. The, the complex problems that we're all facing in design today are, are pretty daunting. They're pretty huge. Um, and it's kind of exciting that we are, we have a seat at the table now, right? We're all being asked to participate in this kind of thinking and this kind of execution and not just come in and say, yes, it should be blue, not red. <laughs> And yes, that button needs to be bigger and change the, the type size. Like, it's amazing. It's an amazing time to be a designer and a design thinker and practitioner. And so, like, let's get involved and play in, in this larger system and think about the smaller pieces that ladder up to it. And then use people. <laughs> um, and I mean that in the best sense. But, you know, human currency, I mean, you guys are so valuable and all of your clients and your colleagues, it's, that is the best currency. That is the best thing to create change and to create social change and, and drive value. It's people. Um, so leverage it, <laughs> you know, really think about who you can bring to the table, who you can partner with, how you can um, leverage digital technology, whether it's social networks or just connectivity and the social sort of tissue that goes along with um, the abilities we have in information and communication and entertainment spaces now at a social level. And don't, don't overlook the power that people bring to your system and your solution. So really, ultimately, I think you are who and how we're going to drive value through social change. And I would love to hear how you guys are thinking about doing this later, too. But I'm so, so inspired by all the stories that I've heard of the things that you're working on and thinking about over this, these past three days. And I can't wait to see where you take it next. It looks so nice.